Hi everybody, Mr. Farmer here, and today in AP Macroeconomics, we're going to talk about the business cycle and unemployment, different types of it, calculations of it, and all sorts of fun things. Here we go. So what is a business cycle? Who is most affected by business cycle and unemployment rates? You can see different things connected to that. So there's four parts of the typical business cycle. The peak, which is the height of business activity. The recession, which is the downturn. Now, this definition has actually changed. It's just a continual couple of months of decrease. It used to be two consecutive quarters. Um, but it's a period of decline in total output income and employment, typically speaking. There's a trough. That's where you hit the bottom. And then finally, you get the happy part, which is where you get the expansion. Everything's on the rise um, and typically follows the recession and uh, trough. And so you typically have a period of increasing of real GDP income and employment rises. And so this is kind of our typical growth pattern. Okay, and so we have a, you know, peak recession trough expansion, hence it's a cycle. So th this does occur, and we can talk later on why this occurs uh, throughout the semester. The main thing you want to see, though, is this positive growth trend that overall, over like, one or two decades is what you'd be looking because from peak to peak is usually around you know depending on the recession five to 12 15 years so that you get to get a while but you have a typical growth trend throughout that's the goal of all this and so you can see from 1950 to 2009 all those big blue vertical lines those are recessions by the economic definition and so you can see about, you know, 53 to 58, there's five years, three years, bigger jump here, 10 years, three years, um, you know, nine years. And so you can see it's it's within that range. Um, and again, post-2008, the economy has been a little different, so we can uh, go into a little bit into that. So 2010 and then to 2019, okay, we had, a, we had an expansion period, so there's about 10 years there. Uh, so you can kind of go from there. Anyways. One thing you'll know is that when you have a recession, okay, you can see the business cycle. So this is the unemployment rate. Unemployment was low during the expansion, the peak, and then you hit the recession and it increases. And then unemployment decreases again and then it increases. Here is you can see the actual business cycle and it's mirrored by the investment category by businesses. We talk about that, how important that investment category is in business sectors and depreciation, all that kind of stuff. In this model, this is why it's an indicator. You can see it also almost exactly mirrors the spending and the, un the unemployment rates. So who is impacted by this business cycle? Um, in general, durable goods are more impacted. People can, and companies can make do. They can get repairs for their appliances, and they just kind of make it work and limp along. Companies will uh, repair machines instead of buying new ones. We'll just kind of go along with that. So durable goods are more impacted by the business cycle. During downturns, you're not going to replace. During upturns, you're more likely to replace that capital. Non-durable goods, you can see kind of groceries, are more insulated from the business cycle because you still got to eat. You might choose a lower price point for the food, but you're still going to be eating stuff. So non-durable goods and non-durable services are more insulated from the business cycle in general. Healthcare, you still need healthcare during the business cycle, for example. Switching over to you, another thing that was talked about was unemployment rates. So unemployment rate is this. The number of people unemployed divided by the labor force times 100. So who's in labor force? You can see the second equation. It's actually identical. Is the unemployed divided by the unemployed plus the employed. So unemployed plus employed equals the labor force. So who is in the labor force? Good question. All right. So labor force consists of people in the United States that are 16 years or older. You must be a civilian. It is the civilian labor force. We'll talk about that in just one second. You need to be currently employed full-time or part-time there is a minimum threshold which is like one hour per week or something or 10 hours for the month so there is a minimum technically but much if you're working you're good or you need to not be working but you need to be applying and looking for jobs you need to be seeking employment who is not part of labor force if you're institutionalized okay so if you're in jail and otherwise incarcerated you're not part of it Military personnel, it's the civilian labor force. And finally, 
people who are not looking for a job are not part of the labor force. Um, now, we do have a term called discouraged workers, so I'll talk about that. So first off, um, if you are currently not working and you're not looking for a job, then you're not unemployed. You're simply not working. Okay. And discouraged workers are a subset of that. Discouraged workers are people who have been applying for jobs and yet they're not getting them. And so they become discouraged and they just simply stop looking for work. And we saw this a lot in 2008, 2009, 2010 uh, during recessions. Um, and so we, we, you do see this. Okay, so discouraged workers are a subset of the non-labor force because they're no longer seeking employment. So let's do a little, little practice. So we have the unemployed and you have the labor force. So what did you do for year six? Unemployed, 10,000 divided by the labor force, 150,000. So you would get a 6.7% unemployment rate. Okay. In the following year, year seven, uh, labor force increased by 25,000. 175,000 people are now working. So the labor force um, is that. So unemployed, 15,000. So the unemployment rate is now 8.6%. So did the number of people increase or stay the same from year 6 to 7? Well, it increased. More people were working in, in year 6. 140,000 people were working. In year 7, 160,000 people were working. So more people were working in general. So this brings up an important point. In order to maintain employment levels, jobs must continually be created based on labor force and the population growth. More people were working in year seven, and yet our unemployment rate increased to that 8.6%. This is why the jobs need to continually increase based on the population, not just maintain them. Now, part-time workers, according to our uh, some data in 2005, 20 billion people were part-time workers. That means they're still employed. 4.4 of these will be considered uh, wanted to be more than full-time. So the BLS receives uh, criticism for kind of evaluating unemployment rate this way. At the very end, I'll actually show you there's six versions of unemployment rate. The version, version three, which is the official, doesn't care if you're full-time or part-time. Okay. Um, other versions would take into consideration. Okay, so uh, just kind of be aware of that. But this is definitely a criticism for it. So what are the different types of unemployment, meaning the causes of unemployment? The first one is called frictional. This means that you have skills, you're simply in between jobs. Um, you, you are hireable, you have skills that are desired, you're just in between jobs, you want better pay, you didn't like your boss, you're moving uh, for whatever reason. So you're, you're in between jobs. Um, on the data, uh, if you look at like the Bureau of Statistics, it's probably going to be called short-term unemployment rates, um, just because the time interval is easier to figure out. Second one is structural unemployment. Now this one is devastating because this job, your skills as they are, are not needed. Okay, There's a change in demand for labor. Your skills and experience become obsolete. Hey, you still know how to repair um, CD-ROM drive. Great. Most computers don't have CD-ROM drives. So your skills are kind of obsolete. So you need to update your, your stuff, which is, again, why in like 2008, 2009, during the Great Recession, a lot of people went back to school so that when the recession ended, their skills were going to be updated. So you do see during recession times, um, people are trying to update their skill sets in order to, when you're out of it, to update to that more recent one. Cyclical this is due to the business cycle. During downturns of the economy, there's not as enough uh, sales to go around, and so you let go of the people that you hired last. That's just kind of the typical, and so this is called cyclical unemployment. And last one is seasonal. Now, most of the time, um, the official unemployment rates is seasonally adjusted, um, which means this isn't really taken into consideration. And this is that you're unemployed during the off-season. So during the harvest times, you are working in the fields, you're doing your job, whatever else. During non-harvest times, you're not doing that. Okay, teachers, during summer, you're not working. Lifeguards, during the summer, you are working. There's a seat for baseball players. You're playing your baseball season. Okay, so there's a seasonal unemployment. The idea is that during your off season, you're not working. And so you make enough during your seasonal 
income to not have to do that. So you're adjusted seasonally for that. Anyways, now unemployment versus participation rate. Unemployment rate, no, we've been looking at. Um, but participation rate is something that college board and also economists are looking a lot closer at. The participation rate is the number of people in the labor force over the total population of eligible workers. So labor force is those who are currently working or seeking employment, what we were just talking about. So you're going to take that number and divide it by the total working age population. So population that is eligible by age. So in the United States, that will be age 16 to 65. If you're in that age group, you're part of the uh, working age population. So number of people in labor force over total eligible workers. So for instance, the total working age population is 195 of them are currently working and five of them are looking for work. Then your participation rate is 100%. Everybody that is eligible to be working is participating in some way. If three of the currently unemployed workers become discouraged and they stop looking for work, then 95 employed, but the active labor force is 97, well, now your participation rate is 97%. So this is the participation rate, and it gets talked about a lot more. So you can see if there's discouraged workers, people who leave the labor force, that's what's impacting the participation rate. So let's kind of go over that example with unemployment and, late and participation rate being talked about. So the total population is 195 that are working. Great. Based on all that data, we get a 5% unemployment rate. Well, if the three of the current unemployed workers become discouraged, then 95 are employed in the active labor force is 97, then our unemployment rate goes to 2%. It actually made our unemployment rate look better. And so again, this is something that came up during the Great Recession. Now people are looking at is, if people stop looking, our unemployment rates look really good or better than they were. But is it because people stopped looking for a job? They became discouraged. And so people looked at this participation rate. Let's take those same numbers and do the participation rate. You know, before we had 100% participation rate. After people, uh, the three, three people leave, we have a 97% participation rate. So we can see, oh, not as many people are active in this market. So the original, 5% and 100%. After, oh, we're doing better. Oh, it's because people left. Okay. So did unemployment actually improve in the country? No. Okay. It, so both discuss the same data but have different interpretations. It is best to look at both pieces of data to get a full picture uh, as far as what is happening, what is the causation behind these things. So you do need to know both um, for College Board um, and in general it's just kind of good information. Now, this is the table. Uh, you can see number three, total unemployed as a percent of civilian is the official. Um, but there's definitely other ones as well. You can see um, number four, total unemployed plus discouraged workers. Okay. Number five, totally unemployed plus discouraged workers plus all those marginally attached labor force. Um, number six, uh, you can see if you keep going, plus total employed part-time for economic reasons. That would be people who are underemployed is the term, meaning I would like to be more fully employed, but I'm not able to. So the different ones are available. You can talk about these, but the official one is the one we are using. So if you want, there's definitely other versions as well. Okay, so natural rate of unemployment. The natural rate of unemployment is considered full employment. Okay, just by definition. So what is the natural rate of unemployment? It is the unemployment level if the business cycle did not occur. So you can see on my table, the natural rate of unemployment at an RU is the frictional plus structural plus seasonal. That would be the natural rate of unemployment. Okay, whatever it is. In the United States, it's currently 4.4% is the fully employed number, and that is 2024. The actual unemployment is the frictional plus the structural plus the seasonal plus the cyclical unemployment rates. Okay, so that would be the actual unemployment. 
So what's the importance of that natural rate of unemployment? It's an important metric for determining what, if any, economic policy should it be. The potential GDP is what would the, GD, the real GDP be at the natural rate of unemployment, meaning at full employment, at our potential output, how much should we be doing? So the real GDP of the economy was at full employment, and full employment is, again, that natural rate of unemployment. So there's an equation that the government will plug into that, um, with multiplying um, real GDP times the full employment levels. And th we don't need to know, but th there is one if you're curious about that. So we, I've never seen a question on this, but here is that equation. So natural rate of unemployment divided by the actual rate of unemployment times the actual GDP. And you can do it the other ways around. I've never seen this, um, but this would be the equation if you ever need it. So if you want to pause and look at that, great. We just need to know by definition what potential GDP is. And so the difference between the actual potential would be what we call a GDP gap. The actual GDP, which is shown as this red curve right here, compared to the potential GDP, which is this, be this blue curve right here. So if the actual is above the potential, that means that we are producing more than we'd anticipate. So if you're producing more, you probably have more people working. If you have more people working, the unemployment rate is lower. If unemployment rate is lower, you're probably in the expansion or the peak in the business cycle. So a positive GDP gap is going to be associated with that. And then you can see, well, up front, you can see the, the business cycle right here, actually. So GDP gaps is the actual mass potential GDP. Again, the GDP is the real GDP at the natural rate of unemployment. So if you have a positive, that would be the actual is greater than potential. You're probably at a peak or expansion. Unemployment rate is historically low. Inflation rate is probably on the higher side, again, according to the typical business cycle. If you have a negative GDP gap, then you're probably in a recession or a trough because your actual is less than your potential. Unemployment rate is going to be higher, okay? Uh, and inflation is usually pretty low, and we'll talk about that when we talk about a thing called the Phillips curve. So again, you can see the business cycle here. So we have the GDP gap is the actual, that would be the blue, and then the potential, that's going to be this orange right here. And so we have our potential GDP, so at full employment, at the frictional plus structural plus seasonal, at this, we should be producing about this much. If I have all the unemployment rates, so I'm looking at how much, what am I actually producing at? I'm going to get my positive. How can we have a positive GDP gap? That means that we need so many workers, we might dip into the structural unemployment. You, I don't really need your skills, but I'll make an exception and make it work. I'm going to dip into that. Friction unemployment, I'm going to pay you money so you don't leave your job. Okay. Negative GDP, that's where you really do have a positive cyclical unemployment. So, man, we're in a downturn. We're not going to hire as many people. Okay, and so we have a larger cyclical unemployment. Okay, so today we talked about business cycle, the who is affected, durable versus non-durable in the business cycle, the different types of unemployment, the natural unemployment, potential GDP, and the last two become very big, long-standing conversations. So definitely want to understand that. So if you got questions, definitely ask your teacher. All right, until next time.